uh, looks like we went up today. <laughs> okay, we should be live. So first of all, thank you, Evan, for being kind enough to join us today and share your experience on COVID from New York City. Um, so just to confuse everybody, we have myself and then we have Dr. Evan Liebner, we have Dr. Evan Liebner, and we have Dr. Nick Vasquez here to uh, discuss the situation with COVID. So I am not cool enough to be named either Evan nor Liebner. I, I apologize. Know, Apparently I do not have the right chromosomal makeup for that either. But no, uh, Evan Rachel Wood. <laughs> um, so New York, Evan, before we get started, um, why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself, tell us about where you work, and just tell us a little bit about what your experience with COVID has been. Um, so I am a ED critical care physician at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City, um, which has uh, been one of the epicenters early on for COVID in the U.S. Um, I spend 25% of my time downstairs in the emergency department. Um, and then 75% of my time upstairs on either the rapid response team or in the ICU. Um, and so I've been involved with COVID and with the hospital system response um, at Mount Sinai for COVID. I was very involved in designing and developing um, the emergency department guidelines and protocols that we used for COVID across the Mount Sinai system, as well as the airway management protocols and guidelines both for the ED and the rest of the hospital across all of the eight Mount Sinai hospitals. Um, and so uh, that's kind of my experience with COVID as of now. Okay, so tell us a little bit about what it was like to be working in New York City through the, the big surge that we all know happened in New York. Um, so it kind of came in as, um, it kind of came in and like, it was a very weird experience. So it started off um, at Mount Sinai, where we had in the emergency room, the first positive uh, patient test for COVID um, in the state of New York. Um, and it rapidly became um, lots of people that came in the worried well early. And so the emergency room the initial things that the hospital and the system did, where they developed what they call the surge space. <laughs> so we had of an urgent care center in the hospital, like on another, like outside down a block from where the ED is. And we, um, the ED leadership rapidly converted the, and the hospital leadership rapidly converted that <laughs> into a COVID kind of urgent care where anyone w that was well appearing, not, um, not drastically abnormal vital signs likely to be discharged instead of being brought into the emergency room was being brought from the greet desk directly to this um, secondary space where they would be seen by PAs and emergency physicians, triaged, evaluated, and either tested or not tested and sent home. And if they needed to, they could be um, moved back to the main emergency department. Um, but so that really helped early on um, in terms of the volume of patients that were coming in and helped the emergency department not get overwhelmed with this surge of, of worried well. Other hospitals in our system um, in the emergency room set up tents outside and did other things, but at the main hospital, that was kind of how we dealt with it early. And so initially we were very busy with this kind of worried well, um, people wanting testing, um, wanting to be evaluated, and who weren't very sick. And while this kind of peaked early, we knew that the second kind of peak was going to be the really sick patients <laughs> um, who came in and who were critically ill, respiratory distress, um, coming in with all the things we saw coming out of Italy and China. And so while this was being built and we were kind of shunting the well people away from the emergency room, we very quickly converted our observation unit. We had a, we have a 24 or 27 bed, I think it's a 27 bed observation unit that we converted into basically an ED critical care zone. Mount Sinai ED, which I can talk about a little bit in my talk, um, had a five bay um, resus area 
and in the main part of the emergency room, there were four negative pressure rooms kind of spread out and not very accessible to the recess area. And so we knew really quickly that that wasn't going to work for the amount of critically ill patients and the surge in patient popul volume that we're going to need negative pressure rooms and intubations. And so we kind of converted our RITU or res um, observation unit into a 14 bed resus area with four negative pressure rooms for airway and intubation, and then a 13 um, bed step down unit for patients that were getting admitted, waiting for beds upstairs, or not quite sick enough to be in the recess part, um, but couldn't go into the main area. And there were several iterations. <laughs> um, we tried, um, we tried making one zone COVID, one zone not COVID, um, but it very rapidly became the case where pretty much almost every patient, no matter what complaint they had, would test positive for COVID. I remember I, I got signed out a patient who came in with like belly pain and was getting a CT scan of the abdomen um, for like an older person for working up for abdominal pain. And the CT scan was read, nothing intra-abdominal, but bilateral lower low ground glass opacities and you, they got tested and it was COVID. And so there was a patient who came in with a fall and rib fractures from the trauma on CT, had grand glass opacities and had COVID. It was almost everyone, no matter what the complaint, was rapidly becoming COVID. And so after a couple of stages and a couple of changes, it wound up that our old intake or our old urgent care area, we kept for less likely COVID patients. So people with like traumatic injuries or something that we thought were less likely to have COVID, whereas everywhere else in the department very quickly became the COVID or the hot zone. And we um, kind of divided it up that way. And very rapidly, everyone was wearing an N95 um, for their entire shift and switching um, gowns and gloves between patients but you would keep your N95 on for the entire shaft with the face shield. Oh. So since then, <clears throat> I take it you've started to see a significant decline in cases or are your ICU still pretty full? So we have emptied out pretty much um, our ICUs are down to, um, we had at Mount Sinai, which I can talk a little bit about in some of the slides, <laughs> we have at the main hospital, before COVID, about 98 ICU beds between a cardiac ICU, two cardiac surgery ICUs, a surgical ICU, a transplant ICU, a medical ICU, and a neurosurgery neurology ICU. All eight of those ICUs became all COVID. Most of the rooms had two patients in them. Um, we took our medical step down and made that into an ICU. Our cardiology step down became an ICU. And all of the PACUs became um, non-COVID ICUs for regular patients that were COVID negative. Um, and those were all run by the anesthesia, uh, our anesthesia colleagues. Um, so we went from about 98 ICU beds to almost 250 ICU beds. Wow. And were you actually having to split ventilators at all between patients or were, were you able to keep up with the need? We, we, uh, the hospital system was able to get enough ventilators. We never um, were having to split ventilators. They had started working on how we would do it if we needed to, but luckily it never got to that point. We never got to the point where we had to decide if we weren't going to intubate anyone. Everyone who needed a ventilator was intubated and put on a ventilator, and we never had to split vents or ration resources, but we, one of the things that the hospital and the system did very well was we have a very, very strong and um, well-staffed palliative care program. And so <clears throat> our palliative care colleagues created a 24 hour a day hotline that was staffed by palliative care attendings at our command center. And so all the hospitals were able to call the palliative care hotline and get help with palliative care physicians, calling families and discussing with patients goals of care. And then at some of the EDs they had uh, palliative care attendings in the emergency room, helping with goals of care, um, filling out paperwork. And we really aggressively had um, palliative care brought up front and had 
honest conversations with patients and um, families about um, kind of the prognosis and help make people DNR, DNI. And if they didn't want to be intubated, we would could early get them into hospice or into the palliative care area, which I think was very helpful and saved a lot of resources for patients who likely wouldn't have done well and who didn't want those type of treatments anyway. Speaking of resources, how did you guys do with PPE? Did you feel that you had adequate PPE resources? Um, so we were very fortunate. Mount Sinai, being a large system, was able to get enough PPE. So we, there were some days where um, some of the gowns would run a little low, but we were never ran out of a, a PPE. We always had um, masks, surgical masks, and 95s, um, face shields. Um, Initially, we were, when it first started, we were using an N95 and disposing it after each patient encounter. <laughs> um, it very quickly became not sustainable when everyone was using N95s. And so we wound up moving to a one in N95 for a shift. If it got dirty, you could get another one. But in general, everyone would use one or two N95s for a shift and would um, dispose of them after the shift. Um, the hospital bought a lot of kind of plastic um, face shields. Like we have the disposable ones, but they purchased kind of the ones welders or grinders would use. And so you could just use wipe those down with bleach wipes or peroxide wipes and wash them off. And so they would be reusable. And so I think that helped preserve PPE as well. And then the gowns. Okay. So this... Next question might be kind of getting into some of the slides that you brought, but uh, can you just describe like the process that you went through developing the COVID protocols you had at your facility and you know, how you figured out what worked, how you figured out what didn't work? <laughs> um, so it started with our airway protocol. Um, the chair of emergency medicine asked um, if I was interested in helping to kind of work on protocols to standardize how we were doing the airway management and our kind of procedures and who would be a high flow BiPAP, what we would do. And so I spoke to the chair of um, critical care, who I also work with as a critical care attending. And so we worked, we set up a working group with myself and one of the other anesthesia attendings who I had worked very carefully, closely with um, developing our difficult area response team for Mount Sinai. And so her and I and the chairs of emergency medicine, critical care, and anesthesia for the system <laughs> um, with um, several other people and um, senior leadership started working on protocols. We had some of the other um, protocols from some of the other hospitals that we looked at. And then we looked at some of the guidelines from um, the anesthesia societies, the Society of Critical Care Medicine. Um, and we put together kind of our best practices and what we thought made sense. And we, it evolved um, over time with kind of updates and changes in the literature. Um, the infection control people were also heavily involved in helping us craft this protocol. <laughs> um, and so we started with minimizing the number of people. So initially we said no residents or fellows who was attending only. We tried to encourage two faculty members and to uh, conserve PPE, we were saying only um, the respiratory therapist would come in, would set up the vent, and then would wait outside the room. We would only have two people in the room for intubation to protect people from exposure. Um, we would only use video laryngoscopy to kind of maximize our space between the patient and the um, provider. Wearing an N95 gown, we usually recommended two sets of gloves so you could take off the outside set after the intubation and then finish what you needed to do. You'd put the NG tube in after you intubated to minimize the number of people and the x-rays that you had to get. Um, and so it kind of was a process. We initially said no high flow BiPAP with a viral filter in a negative pressure room. The SCCM guidelines came out and said, <coughs> excuse me, that they recommended high flow. So we updated and changed it. And it wound up that we were using high flow BiPAP and non-rebreather um, interchangeably, um, just kind of doing everything we could to minimize risk of, um, 
to the providers and to the nurses and everyone. Um, but we, if we didn't use high flow or BiPAP, the volume of people that would have been intubated um, would have been non-sustainable. And we didn't think it was the best interest of the patients because all the patients that we were intubating clearly could have, or a lot of them didn't need to be intubated and could be bridged with um, other oxygen delivery methods. And then from there, once we had the airway protocol, <laughs> um, myself and one of the uh, chairs for one or two of the other emergency departments sat down and worked on kind of more ED specific guidelines for across the system. And so we created a kind of a document of different protocols and we would, as things came up, we would write and update the protocols every couple of days, every week. And that uh, the last protocols were updated and were posted as an EB medicine article, which I can have the link for in my PowerPoint so that people could use and could modify as needed. Very good. So since we've talked a little bit about the airway protocols, can you talk a little bit more yeah. about what the airway management looks like for these people? Like talk a little bit about how you're managing these patients once they're on a ventilator. Um, and did you find there was a tipping point where intubation became inevitable for these patients? Um, so initially we were intubating everyone early. We were doing not nasal cannula, non-rebreather, and if they were still hypoxic, it would get intubated. Um, it very quickly became obvious that that wasn't necessarily the right answer and that these patients were <laughs> um, both not doing well once intubated and it was probably safe for providers as long as they were wearing pro proper PPE to be around patients with non air breather and high flow of annual and uh, BiPAP. Um, and just the sheer number of patients and the volume of patients, um, we had to kind of figure out who needed to be intubated very quickly. And so when initially it was people who were hypoxic got intubated, it very quickly transitioned to if you were hypoxic and you went on some oxygen and your SATs were 92, 80, high 80s, low 90s, even on max high flow and BiPAP, it was okay as long as your respiratory status, you weren't to kipnik, you weren't working hard to breathe, you weren't um, retracting, you weren't uncomfortable. And then that be quickly became kind of the, their work of breathing, their respiratory rate, their ability to talk, and that quickly became kind of the, at least for myself, what I would base intubation on. Um, hypoxia, as long as they were okay, we, we, um, I didn't intubate as quickly on as it got further and further on into the epi uh, pandemic. Um, we were very lucky that we had medicine floors were during the pandemic taking BiPAP and high flow. Um, normally, high, low high flow settings can go to the medicine floors at Mount Sinai and stable BiPAP, but we were putting most of our high flow and BiPAP patients on the medicine floor um, with pulse ox and um, heart rate monitoring, and our rapid response team would respond if they were worsening and if they needed to be intubated. Um, but so if you were on high flow or BiPAP, you didn't necessarily need to go to an ICU. And so those patients would go to the floor and be managed by the medicine services with pulmonary consults as needed. Okay. So since a lot of these patients that you were intubating were pretty profoundly hypoxemic, was there any difference in your strategy for pre-oxygenating those patients that did need to go on to be intubated? <laughs> um, so if the patients were on BiPAP before, I would turn up the BiPAP um, to 100%, give them some PEEP on the BiPAP, and I would set the respiratory rate to 20 to 30, depending on um, how fast they were breathing prior to. And so I would use the, vent the BiPAP as a ventilator during my RSI and leave them on the BiPAP breathing with the BiPAP machine for the minute it took for the paralytic to kick in. If they weren't on the BiPAP, um, I wasn't necessarily putting them on BiPAP just for pre-oxygenation. Um, for concern for wasting um, equipment and resources. Um, but high flow or non-rebreather, 100%. I would have a BBN that I would try not to use unless I really needed to with a PEEP valve. And I would keep them sitting up 
I would do RSI on all the patients, most experienced intubator. Um, although as it got further on into the pandemic, we would let residents and senior residents and fellows intubate. Um, but these patients very quickly became very hypoxic and had no reserve. So even if you would get in an airway within the first, on the first attempt within 30, 40 seconds um, after uh, taking the mask off and starting the laryngoscopy, it wasn't uncommon for patients O2 sets to drop to 20 or 30, which is a little scary. Wow. Can you talk a little bit about the PPE that you wore during intubations and uh, you know other protective equipment? Evan, are you there? I think you might might have frozen frozen up a little bit. Evan. <laughs> Apparently, Zoom will only allow one Evan Liebner at a time to talk. <laughs> <laughs> uh oh. Uh oh. Yeah, it looks like we lost him. Yeah. 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 Let's, yep. see if he, let's see if he pops back. Yeah, I'm curious to ask him not just about the PPE, but this this fight that we have over whether or not it's okay to use BiPAP or not, or high flow nasal cannula or not. You know, it's like you, you've taken SVN, BiPAP, and high flow nasal cannula out of the armamentarium and you just jump right to intubation and there's no like in between um or at least i've had hey, the paramedics or, sorry the, uh, the intensivist tell me that hey, we sorry, lost you there. welcome back <laughs> my wi-fi cut out no problem what were you guys so, talking about evan was just asking about uh what kind of ppe you guys were using during the intubations um and nick was asking a little bit about um your experience with using things like bipap and high flow nasal cannula because i know um especially early on during this epidemic there's been there was a really a big push to be avoiding things like high flow nasal cannula bipap because of the concerns about aerosolizing the virus so we wondered if you could speak to that a little bit of course. Um, the last thing I was saying first was that we would have the um, vent set up so that immediately after intubation, um, we would connect them directly to the vent with the end tile on. So we wouldn't have to bag them, then disconnect, and then put them back on. So they would go directly onto the vent and stay on the ventilator. Um, we were wearing the same PPE, gown, two sets of gloves, so you could take the outside set off after intubation, um, a shield, and an N95. I usually put a surgical mask over the N95 and would take the surgical mask and throw that away and put a new one on after intubation. Um, but that was it. <laughs> um, some of the attendants- You weren't wearing, sorry, you weren't wearing like the, a full respirator or an N100 or anything? Um, we, most of us weren't. Most of us were just using N95s. Um, some of the um, attendings at, or in some of the residents in the emergency room bought their own P100, either half or full respirators. Um, there was some debate within the system and in the hospital about the need versus um, standardizing protocols for cleaning it and contaminating it. Um, so the hospital didn't encourage people using the P100s. They wanted everyone using the supplied N95s and we never ran out. So it wasn't really a problem. <laughs> um, so it was pretty much just wearing the N95, but some people, some of the faculty for a big chunk of it were wearing either the P100 half respirators or the full respirators. Um, what was the other question? Um, Nick was just asking about your thoughts regarding use of things like non-invasive ventilation, high flow, just because there've been a lot of concerns from people about potentially aerosolizing droplets by using those modalities. And so we're just wondering a little bit about what your experience was and whether or not that uh, appeared to be the case. So I think, I think that it was really important that we used high flow and BiPAP. I think initially it was, we were trying to do it all in negative pressure rooms <laughs> and then eventually it became 
in a close in a room with a closed door if there was no negative pressure rooms available. But we were definitely using a lot of high flow and BiPAP. Um, there are a lot of people who are looking at the data to kind of see if it delayed intubation versus it prevented intubation. I think that there was a sizable number of people who high flow and BiPAP prevented us from ever needing to be intubated. And I think there was an, another sizable number of people who just delayed intubation. And I'm not sure if they did worse or if it changed the outcomes. Um, but we definitely <laughs> relied heavily on BiPAP and high flow across the entire system. Um, BiPAP, you can make a little bit safer. You can put viral filters on the exhalation ports. Um, so it minimizes those risks. Um, but the people that we're using it on, we're putting it, um, everyone who goes into the room with these people are wearing full protection. So gowns, gloves, masks, and um, shields, like N95s. And I don't think it was significantly more risk as long as people wore the proper protection. Okay. I think initially our um, intensivists wanted everybody intubated to try to minimize that risk of aerosolization, aerosolization with the um, other modalities. They have uh, recently kind of loosened up on that and actually last week's um, data reports that I was getting have now started to list the number of um, COVID positive or PUI patients that are on high flow nasal cannula uh, or um, uh, BiPAP. Um, so last week was the first time that they're actually now reporting that out. Uh, whereas prior to that, they I don't they weren't reporting it, and I think it was primarily because we actually didn't have any of those patients at that time. Yeah, no, we had a large amount of patients on high flow, on BiPAP, on the floors, in the ED. Um, if we didn't. Honestly, just the sheer number of people that we would have had intubated would have just been um, enormous. And I'm not sure it was what was in the best interest of the patients. Because I think a lot of these patients were able to get by and never get intubated, which I think is probably better for them. Yep. A lot of uh, doing a lot of the auto proning and, and having the patients kind of change their positions to improve their oxygenation. Yeah, um, so we had developed a protocol for the ED <laughs> for self-proning for people. We decided we weren't going to prone anyone in the ED that was intubated. That was only an upstairs thing for the risks for the patients. They were so unstable and so hypoxic that if something got dislodged and we lost the tube in the ED, it would have been a catastrophic event. So we didn't do any intubated patients, but younger, healthier patients who could prone on their own and who could flip over without needing a whole team, we encourage people to kind of flip over on their side, on their back, on their chest, and kind of pig roast themselves or um, baby turn, whatever you want to call it. Um, and so there's some data out of um, some of the other New York City sites that they were doing a lot of, and it seemed to have some benefit. What was the experience that you had at Sinai with um, healthcare workers um, being uh, getting infected. We've had one of our docs um, test positive. He's back at work now doing well. Um, we had one of our uh, other docs that although she tested negative, I think she probably had it. She had the anosmia and um, lots of taste and uh, was sitting like in the high, low 90s and having high heart rates for <laughs> about a week. Um, uh, we heard recently, uh, unfortunately, about uh, one of the Envision physicians in New Jersey who uh, died of COVID. And um, so what was the experience at Sinai that you're aware of? So I know that there's a at least a couple of my colleagues in the ED who got it. <laughs> Some of people who have positive antibodies who never really even noticed they had it, maybe just a day of like a fever. Um, so there was a lot of people who got it asymptomatically, uh, some people who got it asymptomatically, and there was a couple of people who got it who were fine. Um, a lot of our older, or some of our older staff um, <laughs> and faculty um, didn't necessarily, uh, I guess, pull back a little bit, and were working more on kind of telehealth and doing less direct, direct patient care, um, where more of the younger um, providers were direct impact, but a lot, everyone was involved. Um, but across the system, we definitely had 
several older physicians or people who had other comorbidities who got sick and definitely some of them did not survive. And so um, I think physicians or with regular people on the street, I think it was unclear if they were exposure was from the hospital or just outside because it was so widespread in New York City. You were probably as the COVID epidemic or pandemic went on, just I don't have any data, but I would think that you were probably almost as likely on the subway or walking around the city to get it from community spread as you were in the hospital because you were wearing PPE and protection in the hospital and you knew to be worried. Um, but definitely um, older people, people with medical problems, um, diabetes, hypertension, obesity, all the things we know, um, are much more likely to have worse outcomes. And um, the people with transplants, the people with HIV and the people with cancer, all from what I've seen, um, all did not do very well when they got COVID. And people, once they got intubated and went to the ICU, um, their mortality was significantly higher than everyone else, which makes sense. When you did have to intubate people, um... Was there, were you using pretty traditional ARDSnet style ventilation or what kind of ventilator settings were you using to try and um, adequately oxygenate these profoundly hypoxic people? So initially, most of these people, if you caught them early in their disease process, were very PEEP responsive and had very compliant lungs. Um, and so I would start 10 to 15 PEEP, low tidal volume, six cc's per kg, starting at 100% FiO2, weaning down and kind of titrating their rate to whatever their pH, to control their pH and their CO2. The patients that progressed on to bad ARDS over the next days to a week, um, they became like traditional, um, very non-compliant, very difficult to oxygenate and ventilate, and they were much more difficult patients. Um, but initially, most patients, if you caught them early in the disease, once they were intubated, with a little bit of PEEP, were very PEEP responsive. Okay. <laughs> I have one more quick question, and then uh, I'm going to ask you to just go ahead and take us through your slide presentation. But uh, as you started seeing more and more COVID people presenting to your hospital, how did your admission protocol and your admission criteria evolve over time? Because I'm sure early on, you were probably admitting more people that as things progressed and you, your volume started to increase, you probably started to try and manage more and more of those as outpatients. Um, so we, um, if they came into the emergency room based on DOH guidelines and they were likely to be discharged, we weren't even testing most people um, back at the beginning when there was not a lot of tests. But um, it was really um, based on if they could get up and walk and not become hypoxic um, was kind of our initial and most of the time kind of decision point of going home versus getting admitted. And if they looked bad or they had other comorbidities or a concern, we would admit people. But if someone was well appearing, could walk without becoming hypoxic on a short walk test, those people would most likely be discharged. <laughs> I know some of the other system, some of the other systems in the city had arranged to send people who are mildly hypoxic home with a pulse oximeter and portable oxygen concentrator. We would send people home with a portable a pulse ox. We never really got into the portable oxygen concentrators um, from the ED, but those were kind of things that people did. Okay. Well, I know you prepared some slides for us, so why don't we let you go ahead and uh, take us through what you prepared? Sure. So um, Mount Sinai Hospital System is made up of eight hospitals, <laughs> um, as well as um, Elmhurst Hospital, which everyone's seen in the news, is one of the city hospitals that our system staffs. Um, I work in Mount Sinai Hospital, which is east, which has uh, approximately 1,200 beds. It's a tertiary care hospital with all the subspecialties you could possibly imagine. Um, so we kind of had first test testing. Um, as we talked a little bit about before, 
um, we very rapidly kind of got up to this peak from March 13th, middle of April, April 10th or 11th <laughs> was when it peaked and pretty quickly became, uh, came down. This was the data for the system. And then this was the data for Mount Sinai Hospital. Um, and as we talked about initially, when we had this early peak, we were getting testing um, with up to 65, 66% of tests coming back positive. And we're now down at about 3%. <laughs> um, patients who came in who had chest x-rays or CTs or other things that were concerning for COVID, um, especially if they were intubated, even if the test came back negative, um, we had the problem of what to do with these patients. <laughs> a lot of the times we would do like a mini BAL where we'd inject some uh, through the suction catheter, closed suction catheter system. We'd inject some saline and suction it into a trap and then swab our um, COVID test um, pro, um, whatever it is in the fluid that we got back and then send that to the lab. And some of the times that would come back positive. But it really depended on how far into the disease and if they were shedding, I think was a big part of the problem as well as not collecting the samples, right? So there was a lot of false negatives. Um, this was kind of our emergency room. It's about 1800 square, 18,000 square feet. And it was designed, it was overwhelmed before COVID um, in terms of the volume. <laughs> um, it's like a New York City hospital where we don't really have a lot of individual patient rooms. Patients are kind of just in this acute one and acute two zone. The beds are kind of separated by curtains and just kind of people can be packed on a Monday afternoon all over the place and all um, open spaces. And so that was not ideal for kind of COVID and dealing with this respiratory disease. Um, we had four uh, negative pressure rooms in the observation unit and four in the main area, which you can see in yellow. <laughs> um, and as I described before, we had a kind of converted from a COVID and non-COVID zones to critical and non-critical COVID. And so it kind of evolved. Um, initially, all patients who were PUIs, um, when the Department of Health was doing all the COVID testing early on in the disease, are being sent up to a special unit. And then it rapidly, as soon as Sinai got their own tests, went from taking three or four days to come back to taking less than 12 hours. <laughs> to now we have some of the newer tests which come back in less than two hours. Um, as we said, we converted our observation unit into this ICU slash step down unit. Um, we rapidly upstaffed our uh, attendings. And so instead of having two overnight attendings in the ED, we had a third one, one covering the critical, critical zone. And we had residents and PAs um, and extra nurses in the critical area. Um, as we kind of see by this chart, we went from five uh, recesses beds to 13 ICU and 14 step down beds in this area. Um, and we went for our hospital had 11,039 beds to 1453 and from 98 to 235 ICU beds. And this was kind of the change we made to the ED where a Q1 and a Q2 state is kind of regular zones intake became our less likely COVID zone. PEDS volume plummeted and so it stayed the same but the volume drastically decreased and then this area in green became our IC, our recess critical care zone and our step down zone. Um, we developed these system-wide protocols for the ED, we developed system-wide protocols for airway, we shared resources so um, the Mount Sinai system brought in Samaritan's Purse and they sent up, set up a um, mobile field hospital in Central Park next to Mount Sinai. And so that was used to transfer patients. Some of our hospitals in our system out of Brooklyn and Queens, which are smaller community hospitals in areas that were much harder hit than Manhattan was in terms of the number of patients and how sick they were would transfer patients to the field hospital and some of the other system hospitals in the city to kind of balance and to help with needed resources. We shared ventilators, we shared other equipment so that everyone was able to balance. Um, and then 
later on in the epidemic our Mount Sinai Beth Israel which is one of our smaller um one of our other hospitals in downtown Manhattan um some had some of our the units closed prior to COVID it was become a shrinking the hospital footprint got reopened and they built kind of an LTAC type facility um, for these patients not a true LTAC but kind of that type of um, area we developed protocols for laboratory testing and imaging disposition and admission criteria cardiac arrest medication treatments anticoagulation um, kind of the medications and anticoagulations were developed throughout the system of who to anticoagulate with what um, who got steroids, who got um, TOSI versus Rindesivir <laughs> versus some of the other protocols. We developed a protocol for our asthmatics since we were trying to avoid uh, nebulizers because that we were very concerned with um, spreading um, viral particles and the inhalers, albuterol inhalers went on back order so they were very difficult to get to. Um, so the hospital had um, breath actuated nebulizers so we would use those for the asthmatics. We developed a protocol for dyspnea and palliative care treatment with palliative care team. We developed kind of standardized talking points to talk to families if patients were critically ill or dying. Um, we developed some standard uh, smart phrases for the EPIC system so that it could be easier with documentation. And then we also developed an order set across the ED for all of our system EDs on EPIC that had standardized labs, um, treatments, testing, and everything so that it would be easier for the frontline providers to order all the lab out tests and everything we wanted. And then we did the non-intubated proning protocol as well as critical care. We developed kind of advice and management um, for critical care for the boarding patients waiting for ICU beds. The link on the bottom is kind of the, um, the protocols that we published on EB Medicine. Um, they have all the protocols there. And then there's another article on EB Medicine from one of my colleagues at Mount Sinai, kind of an overview of COVID and a review article that's very helpful. Um, this is an example of our laboratory protocol, kind of went chest x-ray, CT ultrasound. <laughs> um, we were not getting CT scans of chest as a diagnostic tool for COVID. Um, initially, if we needed to, we could, um, we would do it more um, if we were sending someone for like a head CT and we wanted to look at their chest, but we were not specifically doing CT scans just to diagnose COVID. And then we kind of laboratory recommendations for in the emergency room if they were intubated or if they were going to the ICU. Um, and then disposition, we kind of, one of my colleagues kind of came up with these criteria based on some literature of higher risk versus lower risk categories. And then who could go home with discharge versus who we developed our, we rapidly expanded our um, telehealth and our Sinai Now um, portal for telehealth visits. And so people we were more worried about, we would get in to see um, a tele-ED visit within 24 hours to check up on them. And then people who would get admitted to the floor versus go to the ICU. Um, upstairs in the ICU, we developed protocols because the sheer amount of people we needed to expand to, to be able to treat. So we started training non-critical care attendings from cardiology, from anesthesia, from um, surgery, and residents and fellows from different services to help staff the units as well as the APPs from those services as well, which was really helpful because the hospital closed um, all non-elective, all elective, all non-emergent surgeries so all the ortho PAs, so all the residents, um, everything, those people were all very helpful in staffing and helping to manage these patients. All the outpatient medicine doctors and providers and the subspecialists all were called in and helped manage the floor patients and they expanded the number of COVID floor teams. And so it was really a cross system um, way of helping to manage the surge and it was amazing kind of our ICUs, um, and then we expanded as we've talked about. We developed teams, so we had an airway team. The anesthesiologist would come to all airways in the ICU and on the floor with the rapid response or the ICU team. And so the ICU and the anesthesia team would intubate together, minimizing the number of people. 
we used our OR techs um, who weren't operate in the ORs anymore, most of who were doing a lot of ortho or neurosurgery spine cases who were used to proning people and developed proning teams that would go around and help prone patients in the ICU. We had a trach team, <coughs> um, excuse me, who would go around um, made up of the surgeons from ENT, thoracic surgery, and general surgery who weren't operating because there was no elective cases. And they would do all the trachs in the ICU bedside with the perk trach kit. And we had our rapid response team, which we have normally, um, which is in critical care attending led with APPs and um, anesthesia um, and residents and fellows. And we expanded and added CRNAs to help. Um, admitted patients would go to the floors. As we said, they would do high flow BiPAP, self proning ID for most of the pandemic would see all the patients and rapid response would help as needed. And then the fellows from other services and residencies would come in and help. And then critical care, we kind of made all those ICUs and helped, we kind of talked about. Um, we did ARDS protocol, low tidal volume, higher PEEP. These patients require a lot of sedation and so it wasn't uncommon to need high doses of benzos or propofol narcotics um, to help sedate these people, um, as well as some antipsychotics. We were doing a very conservative fluid therapy strategy. We weren't um, giving them lots of fluid, which I'm not sure didn't lead to some of the increases in kidney injury. Um, we did early pressors as needed. We would uh, paralyze these patient, patients aggressively if they were hypoxic and needed. Early proning, we used a lot of inhaled nitric and flow land. And then we had ECMO if needed, although um, we were not as aggressive as some of the other hospitals. Uh, most of these patients were on azithromycin and Plaquenil, um, which we have not been doing any, very much anymore after some of the data came out. Um, we were doing steroids for more severe respiratory failure patients mostly on high flow BiPAP or intubated. We were aggressively anticoagulating, full anticoagulation unless there were contraindications, especially the patients that were going to the ICU and were on increasing oxygen. And then we had trials for rudesivir, um, a mesokinal stem cell trial. And then we were very heavily involved in the convalescent plasma studies. Um, kind of already talked about all that stuff, all the treatment. Okay, do you guys have any other questions? A um, couple other things that I wanted to talk about is, first of all, is there anything you know now following all of this that you wish you had known going into it? Um, <laughs> I think um, I think a lot changed over those two, three months. And I think it's a scary disease, and I think patients who you'd expect aren't gonna do well, are likely not gonna do well. Patients who are older, patients with a lot of comorbidities are much more at high risk and much more likely to have bad outcomes. Of course, there are patients who have those, who are older, have comorbidities, who do well and make it out of the hospital. I think a lot of the patients, once they get sick and once they get intubated, are um, much more likely to have worse outcomes than the patients who, ne who don't get that sick. Um, and a lot of the patients who make it into the ICU intubated wound up with trachs um, and going to the um, nursing homes while um, some of them got out and a lot of them died before they, um, either of those happened. Um, so I think it's kind of scary to think about. Um, and I think we're all trying to look at the data and trying to figure out what worked and what didn't work. Um, I'm not sure any of the treatments really worked that well. I don't, um, although some of the data is showing some of the plasma studies are, um, have some benefit as well as some of the remdesivir. I think when it shakes out, a lot of them are gonna work better if they're done early. I think by the time they get intubated and go to the ICU, I think a lot of it's going to show is it's already had missed the boat um, and it might be too late. Um, so I think a lot of the treatments are going to wind up working better um, if done early, although I'm not sure there's a lot of data out there to support that. I think that's just kind of my experience. And then one of the things that uh, has been talked about 
a fair amount on social media and some other places <laughs> is just the the human cost in terms of just the mental health of the people that are trying to provide the medical care. So how are you and the staff, I mean, how are you coping with the enormity of what happened and how are you supporting each other? What, what, do you, what did you find was most helpful? So the hospital created like, um, sent out numbers for counselors and units and there was, um, a lot of the different departments had like daily or weekly or biweekly check-ins and update conference calls. <coughs> um, for a while, the ICU had every day or every other day conference call with all the faculty to give updates and to talk about what was going on, what was working, what wasn't working. The ED developed a kind of like a battle buddy system, they called it. So there you'd get one or two people. And so you would uh, check in on each other and kind of talk um, if about anything you wanted to and kind of support each other. And then there were some counselors and other things that the hospital provided um, in terms of resources for people um, who needed them as kind of as needed on your own. If you wanted to, you could make a um, use of it. Um, some people I think had um, harder time than others or showed it more. <laughs> um, but I think everyone dealt with it in their own way. So, Evan, Nick, did you have anything else you wanted to uh, ask Evan at all? I, no, I thought this was really, really interesting and the data, is, uh, the slides you sent are pretty, uh, pretty striking. Um, really appreciate you talking to us. Of course. And just have some like reactions and then just kind of help me understand a little bit uh, so first of all, a palliative care hotline, um, you, you must have a pretty well-developed palliative care team already uh, to be able to have just a hotline with 24-7. We have a hard time getting palliative care consults within business hours, Monday through Friday. Frozen. Uh-oh. I, yeah. I think you froze again. Yeah. Hey, sorry. There you go. There we go. Sorry, what were you saying, uh, Nick? Uh, I was just saying, can you tell me uh, how long you guys had a palliative care team? I mean, that's got to be a fairly well-developed palliative care team that you have somebody to available 24-7. So um, uh, the system has a very um, well-developed palliative care service. They have a lot of fellows. Um, and they've been a great resource. We have in-house palliative care units in most of our hospitals, <clears throat> even before COVID. And so yeah. I mean, it's a strain on, it was a strain on the palliative care service, um, staffing the service 24 seven from what I've been told, but they were invaluable. Hmm. <laughs> and then you also mentioned a trach team, a mobile team of surgeons who weren't operating on anything else, but they're just roving around looking to do tracheostomies. So the ICU, the ICU normally did their own trachs. We did, uh, most of the ICUs had a per, uh, one of the attendings would do perk trachs, but we were so busy um, taking care of the patients and the surgeons, all their elective procedures um, were canceled because of mm. the pandemic. So they developed a team where the ICU would email um, the trach team and then someone would coordinate and one of the surgeons um, would be assigned, and most of the trachs were done within 24 hours, um, once requested by the ICU. And so wow. they, would, they would wear pappers, they would um, do percutaneous trachs at the bedside with a bronch, um, the same way they were being done in the ICU, but just by the surgical team. Were they uh, helping out with other procedures like lines and stuff like that as well, just because you guys were so busy? <laughs> um, there was also a line team that was available um, that would come in and put in lines. We had a lot of fellows and residents, um, so that wasn't nearly as a big of a problem, but there was definitely a line service that would come in um, from one of the, some of the surgical teams. A lot of our surgeons were um, deployed by the surgery department to some of our smaller community hospitals um, to help out and assist um, supporting the other hospitals as well. So it was kind of a system-wide um, response. Wow. 
<laughs> Excuse me. A um, couple of other uh, things. You talked about expanding your, your ICU trained staff that you, you did uh, protocol teaching for cardiologists. Um, I assume that finding staffing for the ICUs on the nursing side was equally challenging. How did your hospital do that? <laughs> Um, so they, a lot of the step down nurses and they had a lot of, um, travelers that came in and helped. I'm not sure about all the details in terms of how the nursing staffing, um, was accomplished. I wasn't as heavily involved in that. Okay. And how do you, you your, your answer will forever be anonymous. Um, how do you feel that training did for quality of care. I mean, it's better than nothing, uh, but uh, you know, experience goes for a lot. So, how how do you feel that that did uh, quality wise for level of care? So we never said, okay, you have a one a couple of hour course, and here go out and take care of these patients on your own. There was always all the ICUs had in a critical care attending that would round in every patient every day. Um, most of the fellows and residents and APPs who were brought in and who were trained were, um, were, were part of the team. So they weren't there by themselves. They were functioning as part of the ICU team and helping reach more patients and helping expand. So I think it worked out really well. Okay. Um, I but appreciate it was that. Never, it was never just okay, you've taken an hour course here, go manage these critical patients. There was always a critical care attending, as I said, 24 hours a day in all the ICUs. Okay, um, appreciate that. So I got two more specific, or one more specific question and then two sort of general questions. How's your time? Do you, do you have any more time for questions? Yeah, I'm fine. The ICU is not okay. too today. I just have some notes to write. Uh, the mobile field hospital that uh, you said was set up in um, Central Park, what kind of capacity did that have? Like, it what had, did they do? Is it an ICU or just floor they beds? Couple, they had a couple of ICU beds and mostly floor beds. <laughs> and it was helpful in kind of decompressing some of the outside uh, smaller hospitals. I was not heavily involved in it. I know it existed. And anyone who got sicker than kind of like required more specialized treatment would be transferred to the main hospital across the street. So it kind of acted as like a safety valve and helped kind of with um, extra capacity. I mean, it sounds like the real rub was ICU care and critical care capacity. That sounds like it was the real kind of uh, uh, barrier <laughs> other than physical space within the ER. Did I hear that right or am I missing that? Um, it was everything. We filled up almost all of our floor beds. We filled up all of our ICU beds and we kept opening up more ICU units. Um, so the hospital and the leadership for the Critical Care Institute was very on top of kind of the response. And they would, they, all the units, um, they converted all the ICU beds into negative pressure rooms. So all the rooms had their wind um, facility took off the windows and most of the, in all the rooms and put in HEPA filter systems, exhausting out the window and built doors on the front of all of our open ICU rooms. Every ICU, Oops. that's okay. Every ICU across the system, every ICU bed across the hospital became negative pressure. <laughs> All right. I think Nick uh, yeah. had probably had a mid-link call. He had yeah. So. so, Evan, any other questions that you wanted to ask? No. Anything else you guys wanted to ask? No, this was great. This was a really fantastic talk, and I'm really glad that you uh, were kind enough to take the time to let us pick your brain about your experience so that... Of course. Now that those of us that are starting to see a surge, maybe we don't have to completely reinvent the wheel. Yeah, no, it's it, it gets uh, overwhelming very quickly. Um, how bad are you guys getting? Um, it, we're starting to kind of see our surge. Our, uh, I know our ICU at Chandler was uh, at capacity. Uh, when I worked last night, I had a DKA patient that I had to transfer to Mercy Gilbert because the uh, ICUs were completely full. Um, we have 
definitely been seeing an increase in the number of COVID patients we're seeing, um, where we have recently gotten a test that's a little bit more rapid turnaround and we're consistently having a fair number of people come back positive every shift. Um, so we're, we're definitely seeing increasing numbers compared to what we had been seeing over the course of the last several weeks. So I think we're, uh, yeah. we're kind of at the, the beginning of our upsurge and with all the people who just decided yes. they were going to stop social distancing and with all the, uh, the protests that have been going on, I, to be perfectly honest, think that we're going to continue to see an increase for um, the foreseeable future. We, we saw, you know, the relaxation or the expiration of the social distancing guidelines on May 15th. And not surprisingly, starting two weeks later, uh, we started to see an increase. And then oh, one second, guys. Yeah, sorry, I did have a phone call. Seems like that didn't take too long there, Nick. It was a repatch. Um, just uh, how's the guy doing? Okay. Um, it's crazy. It's either anxiety or near syncope. That's all I get phone calls from. <laughs> um, yeah, and the answer to your question. Oh, sorry. That's Go ahead. So, so no. Yeah, so we uh, so with the relaxation or the the expiration of the social distancing guidelines on May fifteenth, we uh, not unexpectedly have started to see an increase two weeks after that. That combined with the uh, you know the rallies and the protests, um, our projections are that things are going to get a lot worse through the end of June um, and peak out sometime in in early July, and. Um, the numbers still look like they will, uh, we will not be exceeding our uh, uh, capacities in Arizona, um, but I am not completely convinced of the models. And we've seen other hospitals and hospital systems in the area start to really fill up. So I, I think we're going to start to get into trouble pretty soon here. Yeah, um, in terms of the, it's, it's a little weird, but there is a lot of people with COVID DKA. <laughs> which is kind of a thing that we've been seeing. It's a little bit not as acidotic, but it takes a while to close. Um, and so we were mostly, at, at least at main campus, we were closing the gaps in the ED before the COVID test came back. And so a lot of them would just have their gaps closed and would go to the floor. Um, so one of the things that we've noticed here in Arizona with uh, the um, with the exact same experience that you had in some respects where the ED volumes disappear, um, we stop, um, you know, doing elective cases. Um, some of the hospitals have faced, you know, financial ruin or, or close to financial ruin. Um, and it's been part, I think, of the background of conversation about reopening and, and trying to, you know, reestablish a lot of, um, a lot of normal activity. How close you know, how difficult was it for New York hospitals budget-wise to live without um, elective cases? Um, so I'm not, I don't have access to all the finances. So I'm, from what we're being told, they were, they're losing lots of, Mount Sinai systems losing hundreds of million of dollars a month. We definitely, from what you hear, got money from the federal government. Um, I think we were fortunate compared to some of the other places who didn't have the surge and the volume, we at least had all most of our hospital beds and ICU beds full. And so while we didn't have the high paying um, elective cases, we still had our hospitals full and we still had our, um, excuse me, our ICU beds full. So there was some money coming in, I would imagine. Um, but it's definitely been challenging, especially now after the surge, our EDs were down at 20, 30, 40% capacity um, pre-COVID for a while. This past week, we were up to 50 to 60% capacity. And so the ED um, uh, shifts, we've gotten rid of all of our moonlighting. And over time, all of our per diems have, don't have shifts right now. And um, all the people are kind of, if you owed shifts and you're behind, or um, are having to do extra shifts and all the people who had extra shifts um, weren't, aren't getting paid out their moonlighting 
and are being having their schedules reduced to kind of balance out so everyone comes back to kind of their baseline. Fortunately, no one's had been put on furlough or had hours cut yet. Um, and our ED volumes are starting to pick up. Um, we're starting to get more busy. And so we'll see, but they've definitely cut the number of chefs and uh, the attending staff because our volumes were just nowhere near where they used to be. Yeah, it's really um, difficult to try to communicate um, to the general public that we ERs and hospitals typically run over capacity. You know, if you have a ED hold in the, in the hallway, you know, that's an extra bed that you've created that wasn't already there. You, you're kind of running at 120, 130% capacity all the time. And the business model is kind of attuned to that. Uh, and then if you have that significant drop off in volume of all other things, but you're getting this huge wave of COVID, it, it's, it's this weird dynamic where you're overwhelmed in one area, but you're completely short in the other area. And it, it makes for some interesting um, finances that yeah. uh, some folks have been, you know, furloughed here in Arizona, not for us, but around from what I've heard, contacts that I've known. Yeah, um, we've definitely, hopefully the volume is picking up. It was weird because like during COVID, all the stroke, a lot of the strokes, a lot of the STEMIs, a lot of the sepsis just disappeared. And it was just all COVID. Everything else didn't seem to be coming in. And so it was where people like staying home and dying at home, the number of people who were um, died in New York City at home drastically increased according to FDNY and kind of, so these people were just, were a lot of these people who would come in dying or would they come in late? We've seen a lot of people coming in later with um, non-COVID complaints and who are much, much sicker than had they come in earlier before. So I think there's kind of all sorts of things going on. We saw the very similar here during the early part of the pandemic, <clears throat> lots more people coming in with their STEMIs who had already queued out and you know people presenting with decompensation of their illness rather than actually presenting with their illness. Yeah. All right, well, Evan, I uh, just wanna thank you for taking the time to talk to us like this and let us learn from your experience. Of um, course. I'm a, Evan, if you have any more questions, feel free to give me a call or text. Sounds good. Very good. But guys, did you have anything else you wanted to uh, <laughs> ask Evan before we wrap up or should we let him get back to taking care of his patients? I just wanted to say thanks. Of course. Right. Evan. Take it easy. Yep, no problem. I'll All be right. in touch. Thank yep. you so much. It was great to talk to you. All right. All right. Take All right. care.